Hi, my name is Jane Schoenbrunn. I'm the writer-director of I Saw the TV Glow, which is premiering in the panorama section here at the Berlinale. The film is the story of two teenage outcasts growing up in the suburbs in the 1990s in America who are obsessed with a scary TV show called The Pink Opaque. Uh, after the show gets canceled and one of them disappears, they have to unravel their queer identities through the lens of figuring out why this show felt more real to them than real life. Hi, welcome to the Teddy TV. My name is Jean Borbobak, and this time we are discussing the film I Saw the TV Glow. Hi, welcome to the Teddy. Welcome to the Berlinale. Thank you for taking the time. Um, let's maybe start with the two main characters at the heart of this film, Maddie and Owen. Can you describe them a bit and um, also how they encounter each other for the first time? Yeah. Uh, Owen and Maddie are two kids, sort of outcasts in their very homogenous 1990s suburban hometown in, uh, in America. Um, they don't fit in. Uh, Owen is sort of a, a bit of a, like, afraid of his own shadow, a bit of mm -hmm. a, a, an introvert. And, Ma and Maddie sort of has had, like, the opposite reaction to not fitting in. She's, she's more of the, like, angry goth girl. Yeah. Um, you know, she, she's, like, uh, wearing too much makeup and glaring at people if they, if they dare to look at her in the hallways. And, um, but they're both uh, obsessed with a TV show. Um, they're both obsessed with this TV show that's sort of... Um, uh, like a bit too scary for kids, but mm. but still for kids. It's a it's a 1990s American cable show called The Pink Opaque about uh, two teenage girls who fight monsters and save the world. Um, and so Owen and Maddie first meet because Owen's parents won't let him watch this show, and so he sneaks out of the house and goes over to Maddie's house to watch The Pink Opaque with her in her basement on Saturday night. Um, and form this bond because for them the show feels it, the show is sort of like a balm the yeah. show is like a refuge for them to hide from yeah this kind of mundane town that they're stuck in um it's also an outlet for their queerness although at the time they don't really have the language for that um and uh you know and eventually they sort of form this alliance around the show and maddie starts taping it for owen and leaving him vhs tapes in in the dark in the phot photography dark room after school yeah. and uh and and you know they just increasingly become obsessed with this television show until it's canceled and then maddie disappears yeah but then what you mentioned as well like it's it's more than just escapism with this with this tv show with the pink opaque um, can you tell us a bit about this aspect of the film? How, um, yeah, maybe the obsession with the TV show goes way beyond the 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 idea of escapism. Yeah. You know, it's not an autobiographical film, but it's quite a personal film. And um, for myself, growing up in the suburbs, growing up as a trans and queer person who did not understand myself in that way, you know, in this sort of uh, very monocultural space of like 1990s American suburbia, which is quite a conservative space, you know, you're not mm -hmm. certainly not encouraged to uh, express queerness and there weren't really a lot of queer people around me. Um, but I think that there is this process that a lot of, uh, a lot of other trans folks hopefully maybe can relate to of, um, finding these sort of um, glimmers of, of yourself uh, in the media you're consuming. Um, you know, and for me, that was, that was television. Um, so growing up in the 90s, I spent so much time watching TV. And yeah. TV was comforting to me in this very specific way where it felt more like a home than the home I was in. You know, or mm -hmm. at the very least, I was being sort of um, fed stories, entertainment that, um, you know, that, that, that I could build an identity around. Um, yeah. uh, for me, that was uh, above all the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, which the TV show in my movie is sort of a l pretty overtly, uh, like loosely inspired by. Um, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, you know, is 
a show for girls, as they would say in the 90s. And so that's I, what they said. <laughs> that's what they said. And I, and, and I carried around a lot of shame about how much I loved Buffy. You know, I wouldn't really talk about it to the people in my real life. And, you know, my dad would tease me, like, isn't that a show for girls, like the father in the film says. And um, But within that show, I found such a, such a sense of... Um, like a gaze mm. on the world that that felt like beautiful to me, um, yeah. and that you know, in hindsight, I can look back on and say like, oh, that was an outlet for my queer identity that didn't really have many other outlets at that time, um, and uh, and yeah, this 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 line, uh, there's there's a moment in my film where uh, the characters say that. Um, the characters on the show that they love yeah. feel like family to them. Yeah. Um, and this really was like my relationship to Buffy. Um, you know, and I think it is, I think there's something particular about being a trans kid um, mm. because I wasn't in myself, you know, yeah. like I didn't have the ability to, um, I, I, I wasn't in the right body, you know? Yeah. And, and so like coming of age and coming into myself sexually and coming into my gender, was complicated and traumatic and 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 not something that like I could express not just because this place that I was was repressive but because the like I literally physically couldn't do it until I had transitioned and so this experience of sort of identifying with fiction or looking to these other characters and these other worlds on the screen to have like a taste of something that could mm -hmm. feel like coming of age in the right way was an ex like I, I think it was uh, like a means of survival almost. Yeah, absolutely. But then it also becomes very difficult to kind of break out of that, isn't it? Because the film as well um, sort of portrays this very strong fandom of these two teens as as a space where, yeah, of course, they can run to this space mm -hmm. where they finally find those kind of codes that resonate with them. But then at the same time, how do you break out of it when everything outside of that framework is not suitable for your needs or, or, or for who you are? Yeah. This, no, becomes, this becomes like a really big issue in the movie. Yeah, I think it, it, it's a movie about like the, li the limits of exploring your identity mm -hmm. outside of your body or, you know, sort of putting yeah. yourself into fiction and living your life. Um, vicariously through yeah. through fandom or through the screen, um, which, you know, before transition was something that was a huge part of my life to the detriment mm -hmm. of my own. I have so many memories of like heartbreak tied to the television shows yeah. I loved yeah. or sort of like clinging to entertainment uh, to do a lot of the things that I think for people who come from uh, more like, uh, you know, like e easier or more normative backgrounds that, um, you know, like the the outlets exist in the real world to sort of like chase love and um, and and feel like yourself. And then uh, this really wasn't available to me, I think, until transition. Um, and the process of, you know, to me, it's it's not necessarily though a film about transition. I think it's like it, it, it's it's a film that I wrote in the early stages of transition as I was dealing with like the fallout to coming out from coming out and this idea of. Um, like holding myself in my entire life until this breaking point. And this really is, I think, like the arc of the film. By the end of the movie, the main character in the film has sort of seen himself in a way that he hopefully will never be able to unsee. Um, yeah. And so for me, it's a film about, I think it's a film about how we cope with repression. It's a film about where repression comes from and the sort of quiet power of mm. shame. Um, yeah. And it's a film about how that can eventually and finally crack in a way that uh, you can't hide from anymore. Yeah, right. Um, what was very intriguing about it is because now we talk about how the characters sort of try to see themselves, define themselves through fiction. And I was, what I found fascinating in the film is how um, sort of this fiction, the structures of fiction, start to imbue the functioning or the working of memory as well. That sometimes memory adopts this, this structuring of fiction. Um, what is your, your take on that? I think that I make films, 
I don't really believe in realism in film, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, I don't believe that there is like a form or a language that you can express yourself through in, mm -hmm. in the film medium where you, you're, you're sort of uh, expressing reality or expressing mm -hmm. something that, that like you could call like a perfect realism. Yeah. And so if, if that doesn't exist, then all you have to work with are various gradations of, uh, of fiction and, mm -hmm. and of um, unreality. Uh, I think that a lot of filmmakers in America sort of like cling to narrative as the only tool at their disposal uh, to represent that. I think I am more interested as an artist in memory, mm. in dreams, um, and in like tone, uh, and in, in, in the sort of like moving through cinematic space yeah. in a way that can evoke, uh, yeah, like the emotional experience of a dream or the emotional mm. experience of thinking back on how childhood felt. Uh, and so I think with this film, I'm trying to do exactly that. It's a memory film. Um, the way that time, the way that space moves in this movie is, 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 is not straightforward, is not trying for realism, is trying to represent like an emotional logic. Um, I think that it's both trying to represent like the emotional, um, uh, like the, the feeling of being young and mm -hmm. seeing something beautiful that you don't quite understand yet. Um, you know, and, and sort of like trying to represent these television shows that had meant something to me as a kid and that are now like woefully outdated as something that, that more as how they felt to watch as a young mm, person yeah. than how they actually looked. Yeah. Um, and, and then I think as the film goes on, its relationship with time is complicated. Um, and for me, I think this was an attempt to talk about uh, dysphoria and to talk about the ways in which, even if you haven't accepted on a conscious level yet that you're trans and that you're half living your life and that transition is the only way that you will be able to feel more full in yourself and your identity and your body, um, you still feel this subconscious passing of the years, mm. this, this, this time yeah. that is sort of um, accumulating, uh, you know, as, as Maddie says in the film, um, years can feel like seconds. Yeah, absolutely. How do you translate all of that into the visuals of the film? How did that process go? Or I would rather say the different visual identities yeah. of the film. I mean, there is, of course, the pink opaque, which is like the TV show within, within the framework of the film. Um, so yeah, how did you approach, approach that? I think I tried to um, do, I, I set myself this kind of funny goal of, of taking sort of like the aesthetics of 90s television mm -hmm. and a lot of the like genre tropes of 90s yeah. television, on-camera narration, um, just like a very incredibly lush, over-the-top saturated color palette, yeah. um, monsters and latex costumes, and sort of transpose it into uh, like an art film vernacular. Yeah. I think I was very interested in um, it, almost creating like a, a glitch for mm -hmm. audiences watching it of um, am I watching something that's like, uh, yeah, like a, a very um, uh, slow and airy, non-narrative driven, art driven film or am I watching something that's like playing with the hokey genre motifs of, yeah. that, of that like American 90s genre television uh, space. And, and I thought it would be the most interesting to sort of have that be a constant question throughout the film. Um, I think in terms of that, that's like the, the beginning of the film. Uh, to me, the film um, very much has this narrative arc of going from this very romantic, mm. nostalgic, um, you know, one of the first scenes in the movie is set underneath a parachute in yeah. gym class. And so you're just covered in these like lush rainbow colors. And then by the end of the film, you're stuck in this arcade that's like an yeah. ultra modern, almost like Dave and Buster's style casino that just feels like completely hellish and oversaturated yeah. in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, this was the arc of childhood to pre-transition adulthood, right? Like yeah. something being bled, some kind of romanticism being bled out of mm -hmm. these, these spaces that we were told as young people yeah. were beautiful and, uh, you know, and, and, and spaces to hide within. And, and, uh, and, and so the, the palette and tone of the film, I think, becomes much more aggressive and much more horrific as it goes on, almost as if um, everything that was once a place of refuge has almost become a, like a, a prison or a haunted house by the end yeah. of the film. Yeah. 
you also shot the film on 35 millimeter film, but then obviously the pink opaque is like um, goes through more of this like VHS uh, type of aesthetic as well. And in a way, um, watching the film, it to me it kind of also became a sort of contemplation on this like analog digital and this kind of transition from analog to digital. Uh, can you talk a bit about this aspect of the film? Yeah, it, I think in this film, I've made work before and I intend to make a work again that is sort of uh, coming from like a media theory or sociological mm -hmm. perspective and talking uh, very like overtly politically about our media landscape as a way to yeah. talk about like sort of our condition as, you know, like a late capitalist Western society with a lot of sickness within it. And that's all present in I Saw the TV Glow. But I think I wanted to set myself the task with this film of, of, of something where I'm using media and I'm using screens and I'm using our evolving relationship to technology and to entertainment uh, as more of like a personal metaphor. I think in this film, like the metaphor uh, is, is like the way that when I was a kid and I would sit there and watch these TV shows on Saturday night on this little screen that could just be imbued with such romance. And yeah. by the end of the film, this scarcity or this this romance is gone. And, you know, you have these giant flat screen TVs oversized yes. and everything is available all the time on them. And, um, you know, it's almost become this like addiction. Uh, totally. And... And that felt like an interesting metaphor, that evolution um, from the sort of uh, romanticism of analog to the hellscape of digital yeah. to talk about what's happening emotionally for the character um, as, as he's sort of growing up and, and into a life that's supposed to be getting better and yeah. fuller, but is actually becoming uh, more of a void. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, it's also just so, so fun to play with mediums, you sure. know, and... Um, my first film did a similar th questioning of uh, mm -hmm. lo-fi aesthetics with more yeah. of a traditional um, like omniscient third person uh, cinematic uh, language. Um, and, and for this film, yeah, the, the, the sort of um, the merging of like a VHS aesthetic with this like 35 millimeter was, was, was so much fun to play with. There are actually shots in the film where um, because we had a lot of resources for post-production, we had so much fun with it. It was, um, we would spend, probably spent a week just on VHS footage of these transfers. We would do transfers to like expired VHS tape and transfers to yeah. beta tape, which is a little more uh, high quality. And then there are certain shots in the film where we're actually layering all of that on top mm. of itself. Yeah. So the background might be from the 35 millimeter scan. Right. And then the foreground is from the lowest quality VHS, yeah. but I wanted to pull out these details, so we yeah. layer in a little bit of beta in there, and yeah, painting like that, uh, and painting these pictures mm -hmm. that are very, um, yeah, like elaborate with their use of like yeah. animation and CGI as well, became yeah. like a, it was very fun as an artist to get to play with those tools. Yeah, I can imagine. And it's also nice to tie us back with this idea of time that we talked about, like also just like, I don't know, in, in those times waiting for the, TV show to come every Saturday night, like yeah. the Pink Opaque is on Saturday nights. And then nowadays it's just like, yeah, you can like binge everything down in basically one sitting. And at the time there was like also this, yeah, I don't know, this kind of like suspension of time that was like related to fandom where you constantly had to like wait and, and see how everything goes further. And I do think the political element of it would be this like conversation around like nostalgia, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah you know, this, this, this desire to like reclaim some pure, innocent, mm. romantic relationship with the media of your childhood. To me, that's like an inherently conservative desire, right? It's yeah. this like return to yeah. innocence that's sure. ultimately going to be impossible. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I think I tend to like subscribe to th this style or way of thinking, the like Mark Fisher school of like hauntology, mm. right? This idea that like, yeah our nostalgia culturally is hard to disentangle from like the end of history as it were, uh, you know, in the 1990s yeah, and the way in which like 
our world just feels like it's decaying and 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 our media can sometimes feel that way as well you know yeah we're rebooting 100%. the same thing over and over again and trying to like return to this idea of yeah. like childlike nostalgia as a way of hiding from the ways in which we aren't looking at ourselves as a people yeah now the last thing that i i want to get to because that was also very intriguing to see um the role of screen in in the film um this is something that the characters are able to kind of transgress and then of course the pink opaque sort of serves as a mirror platform as well for them but then it's also uh, again goes beyond that function of the mirror and then in a way i am curious how like thinking about this and putting it into the film how did that um impact your consciousness about making a film which is once again going to be a screen there's going to be an audience that's going to somehow relate with that screen it's something i started with my first film we're all going to the world's mm -hmm. fair and um on that film very early on i think i i i happened upon this metaphor that i feel is is very um it can be taken in a lot of different directions of of using like the screen as a primary sort of visual idea and symbol and image in the film which to me is almost like this invisible way of talking about uh modern life in a way that I don't think we do so much actually in our media because yeah. we watch our media on screens but the screen is often um kind of invisible in the art right. we consume um and make uh and it's a shame because i i think that like the screen is like one of the more dominant sort of ideas in our in our world we spend so much time staring at screens it's almost constantly yeah. and and so how can our identities not be diffuse and formed through this relationship mm. to screens um i think as i was beginning to question my own gender identity and beginning this very surreal process of transition that 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 felt like becoming myself um i sort of zeroed in on this metaphor of of the screen as a way to talk about that process and mm -hmm. all of its strangeness and surreality and complexity um there's a line that is in both where all going to the world's fair my first film and i saw the tv glow mm -hmm. where a character talks about what, describes life as feeling like watching themselves on a screen yeah. and they say um you know from all the way across the room and in this film Maddy who says this line yeah. talks about this experience of traveling further and further away from the screen until they couldn't even see it anymore. Yeah. Um and so I I think there is this conversation in the work and will be continued. I I refer uh to to this as my screen trilogy. Okay. Uh, uh the the screen almost becomes a way to talk about transition or the way to talk about um how life used to feel like um like I was sitting in the audience watching yeah. myself and the further into my queer identity I I I transcend I I start to feel more like the character on the screen um yeah and and yeah I I think I've been dancing around that idea in a number of ways in 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 the work so far and intend to continue to push it deeper Yeah, well, we are definitely looking forward to that. You said it's a trilogy. This was then second part? This is the second part. The third part is um going to be a lot Yeah, the third part is going to be a lot bigger and and longer because to me the the first two films are almost um not about transition yet. You know, the mm. first film is about dysphoria and not understanding yourself and searching for a language through which you can understand yourself. and the second film is about finding it i saw the tv glow is yeah. about the moment where you do see yourself but i don't really think either film actually uh crosses over in, into talking about the the process of transition and and the feeling of mm. becoming yourself yeah. um and there's a lot to say about that yeah that's for sure and yeah you are definitely waiting and uh, <laughs> i'm curious to see what's going to be Thank then you. this final part of this trilogy. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time and uh yeah, I wish you all the best for the Berlinale. Thank you.